excellent. Well, welcome to our webinar this afternoon, Uniting Our Voices for Advocacy and Change. We are so lucky to have the Utah Legislative Coalition for People with Disabilities. I'm gonna to refer to your organization as the coalition because that's a mouthful. And I'm, I'm gonna say it wrong if I keep saying the whole name, but we are so lucky to have them here. This coalition works um, in the state of Utah to advocate for our community, people with disabilities and all abilities um, to create policies, change laws, um, uh, route funding into the areas that we need it most and really to support families. So we are so excited for them to be able to tell you a little bit more about the organization and ways that you can get involved and make change and create this beautiful community for everyone. We have three speakers today. We have Janet Wade, who's the secretary for the coalition. She's currently retired, but previous to retirement, she was the senior director of children's services for Easter Seals Goodwill. So you may have seen Janet at some of our events. She um, used to attend as part of Easter Seals, some of the United Angels Foundation events. We also have Gina Polamoni, who's the treasurer for the coalition. She's also retired, but previous to retirement, she was the, um, she was with Utah Family Voices and the Assistant Director for Utah Parent Center. She's a mom to five, um, including two sons who have a rare terminal syndrome, one daughter with an undiagnosed rare condition, one son with epilepsy, and one son with ASD. She's a family advocate um, with over 34 years of experience, um, keeping her two sons' memories meaningful and providing comfort and support to her daughter during this diagnostic journey. And then we do have a third speaker who's gonna be joining us, Everett Bacon, who's the chair for the coalition. She's the president for the National Federation of the Blind of Utah. And she specializes in issues involving individuals who are blind, who have low vision of all ages and all backgrounds. So we are uh, really lucky to have three wonderful speakers today. I'm gonna to turn the presentation over to you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, and I'll share my screen. And I just want to make one correction. Everett is a is a he. Mm -hmm. um, so when he comes on, um, he of course um, is. We are so blessed to have him as our chair. Okay, let's. Okay, just to see, can you see my slides? Okay, perfect. Um, as we get going, I just want everyone to know um, as we have the slides and this presentation, we welcome questions at any point in time. And we also are a tag team with all of this. So I may be introducing the slide and Janet will have much more to say. And as Everett comes on, um, he may take the lead. So just, just so you know that we are doing this in a formal way, but also informal to make it as meaningful as possible for all of you. So um, I know that he said that maybe using the coalition um, because it is a mouthful and many people refer to us as LCPD, which is a lot easier to say than the full name. I will though um, tell you if you look online for LCPD, just know that it also stands for, I think Layton City Police Department and that's not us. But um, we have been around and I forgot to write this down. Um, I believe that coalition started in, I wanna say 1982 mm -hmm. and um, has been building strength ever since. We had a great set of leaders for many, many years that really built up a great reputation with our state legislature and such. And part of it is in some of this that um, we'll go through. So our brief overview of course is you can make the difference. And we're gonna give a few stories about from our part on how we've seen that happen and um, knowing that we are the experts, those of us that live this life are the experts. And so we can make be part of the solutions. And it's actually the actions we all can take to educate the decision and policymakers for issues that affect all of us, especially our children, youth and adults with special health care needs and disabilities in their families. So we are a 501c3. 
And we advocate, and when we say advocate, because we are a 501c3, it's really educate. We're, we're helping to educate families to do their own advocacy on behalf of their families, their children, because nobody knows your family better than you do. And um, our membership is open to all and is comprised of voting and non-voting voting members, meaning that uh, many of the families and individuals with disabilities and special health care needs are usually voting members, but we also partner with um, the agencies in the state, as well as you know legislators and such. And usually they're non-voting members in, um, due to conflict of interest. Is that correct, Janet? Yes, that's correct. So I love this saying because I remember being here. Um, I always wondered why somebody doesn't do something about that. And then I realized I was somebody. And when I started out as a mom, that journey started out 34 years ago. And I just remember all of the red tape and the holes that we as a family fell into to try to get medical services for my son that at that point in time, there wasn't waivers and such, and he was technology dependent. So we really had a mini ICU in our front room. And I just thought, if I was in charge of Medicaid, then I would do this. Well, that's what began my journey was, yeah, I don't want to be in charge of Medicaid the more I find out about it. But I realized that all of those that I wanted to make it to them to make a difference, they didn't know how to make a difference because they hadn't heard from families like mine to know that their policies weren't working. So I'm asked, you know, what is public policy? We were talking about beforehand for even me to this day, you know, it seems so intimidating in speaking up and in such a formal manner and does it really matter? And um, I am here to, you know, actually, you know, say yes, it absolutely, the more voices and of those of us that live this life and have that expertise that truly make their voices heard is what leads to the changes and such that we all need. And, you know, to develop and in, implement those laws, policies, rules, and procedures that impact our lives personally. Oh, and I want to stop for a second and welcome Everett. He, Thank and you. so, um, Everett, they, we did a, a quick um, bio for you and I want to see if you want to take the lead now or if you want me to read and you fill in. I think it'd be easier if you read and I'll fill in. Okay. Um, thank you. I, the one thing I, I'd like to, to add on to what you were just saying, um, you know, one of the things that, that, are, that is in Gina's um, slides is, is something really important is legislators um, are notorious for uh, thinking everything is hunky-dory and everything's fine. They, uh, uh, until you tell them and tell them and tell them and tell them again uh, that, that, that an, an advocacy issue or, or some kind of, of, of problem that you, you see that needs to be rectified, uh, whether that be through funding, whether that be through a policy change or whatever, uh, they 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 just they just go about their business. Um, so squeaky wheel definitely gets grease uh, in advocacy. And if, if you're not squeaking, you won't get any grease. Uh, and 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 that's just that's just the way it is in advocacy and legislation. Yeah, I'd like to add to that. This this legislative session, there were a lot of new legislators, and at the very first social services committee, one of the legislators just was appalled and amazed that there was a waiting list. He did not know that there was a waiting list for DSPD services. So Everett, right on. I mean, we have to tell and make relationships with our legislators. As Gina says, parents are the experts. Okay, so the legislative advocacy, and this is just what we were talking about, if those policymakers don't hear from you or others, they assume everything is okay. 
In advocacy, often it is a single voice that becomes the most um, effective tool. And so when we hear about that, and you know, there we do have legislators that have um, a lot on their plates and they have um, information given to them through a fire hose. So, you know, as Everett said, it is really the squeaky wheel. And that, that isn't meaning, you know, just to keep bugging them, bugging them, bugging them. That really is to keep educating them, keep educating them in a respectful manner because we do want legislators on both sides of the aisle um, to really respect, you know, families for what they bring. So when you're thinking about legislative advocacy, it's really what change do we want to bring about? And what is going wrong? Where's that evidence? What must change? And what's an alternative? And who can make that change? Is it the legislat legislature or is it maybe um, a department had? Who has the power? Who are our allies? And this is most important. Who are our opponents and why are they our opponents? Because as soon as you know that, that brings so much power to help you effectively advocate or educate on your family or your community or even your state's um, you know, needs. And, and what is that change that you want to bring about? And I always like to say, I, I don't bring it up very often, but it really is. Um, you are coming about it. You don't need to know everything about why, you know, that policy or why that law came into existence and all the numbers and stuff. What you need to know is how does it affect your child? How does it affect you? How does it affect your family? That's what you need to know. And then going forward, you kind of can, from your own family, really talk about the return on investment, because that's where the keywords are for any legislative body is they want to know that if, especially if it has funding that goes along with it, where is the return on investment? And those are usually so easy to come by. And so I'll, I'll hurry and advocate join the LCPD because, you know, if you have questions on what is that, we can help with that. And then uh, Everett or Jenna, anything else with that? Sure, you know, and, and as you're, you're developing these relationships, you learn things. Like um, I, I've been working with uh, the, the, the different Utah uh, members of the house um, over on a bill that is uh, regarding uh, an affordable tax credit for assistive technology purchases. Uh, and meeting with uh, Congressman Blake Moore, I learned that uh, uh, he has a, a child with autism uh, and that his wife has gotten extremely involved in autism advocacy. Uh, and so that's something I, I didn't know until I got to, to know him a bit. Uh, I also learned that Congressman Chris Stewart has, has hired uh, a, an, an intern um, with autism and is in, in both his um, Utah office and in his Washington DC office. Uh, and so I, I learned a little bit about that as well. Um, so th there are lots of things you, you kind of learn about these individuals and you can use to your advantage uh, just by getting to know them and by, um, you know, keeping in contact with them, scheduling uh, times that you can meet with the him or with them or the staff members, things like that. Thank you. So on our basic advocacy points is, yep, you do not need to be an expert in all things about that policy. You just need to care enough to get involved and speak up. And your, your potential influence is far greater than you think. Um, everybody has a different formula that they come up with, um, but usually our state representatives, senators, you know, they say if they hear from one that kind of counts for 10 plus constituents in their area, you get to the federal level and they say if they hear from one, that could mean, you know, 100 plus. So they know if it, it you know, so even getting 10 people to um, contact their, their representatives 
it really does bring a big bang for the buck. And then we all also know that speaking up won't guarantee that you'll win, but not speaking up guarantees that your information won't be known. And then your only task is to be yourself, a citizen and a voter who wants programs and policies to work for those who desperately need it. Yeah, and I, I would agree and echo that. And, and what, what um, Gina is saying, you don't have to, like we have a bill, HR 431 is an ac access to affordable technology act. And we've been working on that bill for quite some time. And we have actually all four of the members of the house that who have co-sponsored that bill. But um, I couldn't quote every line of, of that bill to, to them. I try to look for specific bullet points out of that bill and I, and I focus on that information. So, so I give them a, a brief understanding of what the bill is supposed to do and, and, uh, and how it's supposed to work. And then I really focus on personal stories. Um, so I'll, I'll get two or three individuals, parents of blind children um, or uh, a, a blind educator I, I will get those individuals to talk about personal stories about how the assistive technology has impacted their, their life, their career, their education, uh, whatever. And, and those personal stories usually hit home and, um, and, and usually take us to that next step, um, kind of pull at that heartstrings a little bit of the, of the uh, legislators. It works really well. Uh, so you have to have a basic knowledge of what your bill is but then um, really try to have some personal stories uh, that, that can really hit home with the uh, members of legislation you're wanting to, to work with. So the, the beauty as well um, in whatever it does and, and in what some of our leaders in LCPD has done in the past is build, build up those relationships with the local legislators or with congressional representatives and senators. And what happens then is they will come to you for advice and for information because they know that you have the knowledge. So it's building up that relationship. And then the next, the golden rules of advocacy will kind of give some guidelines on that. But that relationship is all important because once they start knowing that you're the go-to person, it's awesome. So these golden rules of advocacy have been around with the LCPD for quite some time and over time have been, you know, tested and still um, are true to this day is, you know, when you are talking um, to anybody in the legislature or another policymaker and whatnot, it's be fair and be, and be respectful, avoid cynicism, be understanding be friendly, be reasonable, be thoughtful, be constructive, be realistic and persistent, as we said, the greasy wheel, be practical, be a good opponent, be informed, be discreet, be visionary. A lot of those may seem like, you know, that's just common sense, but in some of this, what I will say is, you know, sometimes legislators um, can't see eye to eye with us or very much disagree with something that we want or we have said. And what I learned early on from those that have been involved with the legislative coalition for a long time, the, the previous leaders was that you need to remember that your biggest challenge, which could be a legislator or your biggest hurdle could actually be your champion for the next thing that comes along. So to keep those, um, you know, those relationships um, going and, and again, you know, be that good opponent and know that we're not always going, going to see eye to eye. And I would also, being discreet is important to me because I've heard so many times that, you know, um, Families sometimes, instead of just speaking on their own behalf, they did they don't get permissions of other families and start naming names and saying they're going through this and that. 
And, you know, if, if they have given permission by all means, but I think in, in a lot of times we think that um, we as families, we as individuals, we are all living this life um, when we think that we all agree. And that's not that, you know, we're all individuals and have unique uh, circumstances. So being discreet is, is quite important. And also understanding of those that um, may be on the other side of the issue. So those are all good things because the more that we know and the challenges that come about only inform us more to help make a difference for our families. So with that said, uh, we know that we just got out of the legislative session for 2021. The general session begins the third week of January and ends the first week in March every year. But interim, interim meetings are held year round on the third Wednesday of each month. And I'm gonna let Janet speak a little bit more to that. Yeah, so interim this year start on the 17th of May. Um, but the interim committees that you would be interested in are on the 18th of May. So, so Health and uh, Human Services Interim Committee is meeting, um, uh, I believe it's 8.30, and also Education is meeting at 8.30 uh, on May 18th. So the interims is where um, they have projects or uh, items to really research and look at uh, for what might be coming uh, as a bill in the next session. So one of us from the coalition at least will attend or uh, listen in on Zoom to those interim meetings so that we can pass on information to our members. We always try to, to keep in touch because things come up there that you can really start that dialogue about. Because sometimes by the time it's got to the bill stage or to the floor, it's, it's not too late, but it's harder to change things. Everett, could you expand on that? So I'll go ahead and jump in and just say on this, you know, learning the lingo is, is great. And so you'll always hear about appropriations. Of course, appropriations always mean that there is a fiscal note or money attached, um, usually for budgets for state programs. And then a bill, of course, is a proposed law. Some of the committees that happen through the legislature are the rules. And that's, that's who decides if and where a bill is heard. And then the standing committee is, they hear the testimony and they vote on the bills. And then you, of course you get to the appropriations subcommittees where they hear the testimony again, prioritize funding requests. The appropriations subcommittees are key during the legislative session for families and individuals to sign up, to give testimony, to talk about if it's an issue important to you, to talk about what it means to you and your family. And even during this last year, as hard as it was with being all virtual, they did have um, a great way to, you know, have families and individuals and others um, testify. And then we have the executive appropriations, um, which is the leadership, and they determine the final state budgets. And then, as Janet was just talking about, the interim, which meets between sessions to study those issues. And sometimes we'll get a special session, which you know happens after that 45 legislative session to deal with issues that are urgent and can't wait until the next legislative session. So to keep in touch with what's going on, I'm sure most of you know this, but le.utah.gov. If you go to that page, you'll see three little boxes at the bottom and one's the calendar and you just click on the calendar and then it tells you what's going on that week. There's not, nothing going on much until that May 17th. So that's, that's really important to just keep a track of that. Um, Legislative Coalition, uh, Sylvia and Kristin have joined the coalition. So I've just sent an email out to members 
with that information and the link to the calendar page. Um, so that's one way of, of keeping in touch with what's going on. And we'll have a visual of that just in a few slides. Um, yes, um, is a great um, short video. It's kind of funny. It was um, done a few years ago. It's called the Utah House of Representatives Wrap. I am not going to play that right now just because the audio seems to um, not do well on my particular um, computer. But I do encourage you all to write down Utah House of Representatives wrap and Google it and watch it. It is, it is a great comical way of those in leadership that um, talked about how a bill becomes a law. So here's um, what I just said. So apologies for the duplication, but those are the committees. So here we go with the um, Utah legislature has quite a nice uh, website and it's um, to, I've, I've looked at other states and such and I think Utah does a really good job of helping constituents find the things they need to be involved and know what's going on. So um, there's a couple of different spots to track what's going on and this is usually during um, the actual legislative session is you can do tracking and um, you can get emails and such if there is a particular bill that you're um, wanting to see how it goes through committees and such and those hearings. So that, that is one um, place. And then this is the floor calendars. And um, when, when they are voting on uh, bills and appropriations and laws and such, you can also go to the floor calendars. You can kind of see where those bills are. Are they in the second reading? They're the third reading because there is a process on both the House and the Senate side of how those bills move along in the process. And I don't know, Everett um, or Janet, do you want to comment more on that? Oh, that's going to be boring. See, here's the calendar that Janet was referring to. And of course, this um, is full because it was a screenshot during February. But you can see that they list, you know, what time those meetings are. And actually, if there is, you can click on them. And if there's an agenda or any handouts, you can actually click on those and get those for yourself to see um, what, how their agenda is going to go. And if there is information that they're giving out, you can, you can uh, get a copy of that. Jean, I'd just like to say, we hope that there will be in person and that the, you know, everything goes well. Um, the Social Services Committee is usually held the first two weeks at eight, uh, eight, eight o'clock in the morning, so bright and early. If you do go to the Capitol, make sure you get there very early because parking is premium and it's a long way if you have to park up the hill. Um, but it, it is really good to attend and sit in the audience because there's an opportunity then when the meeting's finished to grab a legislature and actually say, you know, you're my legislator and this is really important to me. So it, it's again, a way of building those relationships and also an opportunity to talk to me, Gina, anybody who's, you know, advocating and also state agency representatives are there too. So we've missed that this year because it's all been on Zoom. So we've missed Sometimes it's felt like we were in a black hole because we've missed that interaction with people. But if we can go next year, I strongly advise you to, to go and attend. So this is an example of the um, Health and Human Services Committee. And I just wanted to show this because it does show the members that are on that committee. So you, if you know who your your um, representatives are and your senators. Um, I can tell you one of the 
best things that anybody can do, even as intimidating as it sounds, is to make a personal phone call um, or email to your, your representative and let them know that you are their constituent. And, you know, even if, say, things are going well, you know, just send them a thank you of, of the work that they do on behalf of children and adults with disabilities. Or if things are not working well, give them your family story. And sometimes, you know, in after COVID, um, I've, I've heard many stories where families said they came and visited us so that they could kind of get the glimpse of a day in the life of what families go through. So that is one of the best tools to um, utilize is get, getting to know who your representatives are. And when I talk about that, I'm talking about your representatives, your senators um, at the state level and also at the congressional level. And um, I think I got myself where I, you can hear me now, right, Gina? Yep, we can hear you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, one of the things to um, follow them on social media, especially your, your local uh, legislator, um, uh, uh, Congressman or uh, Representative Briscoe is, is my local um, uh, representative in my district. And um, it's pretty funny. I, I follow him on Facebook. I follow him on Twitter. Um, I'll, I'll like a tweet that he puts out or things like that. Um, and uh, he, we actually exchanged mobile numbers and uh, he, he's uh, gone as far as to text me and ask me if he could put a sign up in my yard when he was running for election and things like that. So you, you can develop that, that um, relationship with them um, and, and social media is a good way to start that. Because once they see that you're following them, uh, they take an interest in that, and they'll follow you back, and 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 um, it can kind of go from there. Um, it does. It does mean you got to be careful and not say anything negative about them, uh, unless they deserve it, of course. But you know, if you if you do something like that, they they'll see it. So you got to always keep that in mind. Most definitely. Okay, here is a sample of one of the agendas. And what's nice about this is um, when you go to it, you can click on the highlighted bills and it will give you more information about that bill as well as the sponsor and um, such. So it gives you so much information, even if you're having to advocate from a distance because you know there we do like the in-person stuff because building relationships, we all know that you know meeting face-to-face -face does help with building that rapport. But having more virtual options these days allows many of us families that are homebound or cannot get up to the Capitol still have a voice and still know what's going on. Um, to find your legislator. They actually have this on the website too. It's, it, you know, it's very user-friendly and you can enter your address and zip code and all of that. And it will give you who your um, legislator is. And um, you can, then you know exactly the names and such and you can contact them by email, by phone. And again, I know we're still kind of in this COVID um, era, but when that lifts, um, visiting them is also highly recommended. So the communication with legislators, I will say again, it's so important and they listen more if you are a constituent in their districts. So it's important to know who your, um, legislators are, and even if your legislator doesn't sit perhaps on one of the committees, like the appropriations committees, that's okay. Still reach out to your representatives because they all know each other. And if you were to call somebody that maybe sits on transportation, they're not on social services appropriations, but you know they can talk to their colleague and say, hey, I just heard from a constituent in my district and this is a big concern. Again, that carries a lot of weight. Um, during the legislative session, um, 
the sometimes you can't necessarily get in touch with them as fast as possible. So I, I suggest always to get to know their interns or their Senate staff, depending on, you know, whether you're looking at the House or the Senate, because they are in the know usually with what's going on with that particular legislator. And the more information you can give these staffers, the better, because, you know, behind the scenes, they're really helping our legislators. But you can um, get their information off of these websites so that you can, they list um, their phone numbers and addresses and such. So you can have the opportunity to contact them in whatever way is comfortable for you. And as Everett was saying, this is huge now with social media. Um, during the legislative session, you know, many are on Twitter and they're um, getting information in real time. So if there's an issue or something that's going on that, you know, really impacts your life, there is sometimes, you know, live real time information and in that you could, um, you know, get back to them. Now, I, I have to admit, I, I don't know how to tweet. So others can probably give more information on that, on how that goes back and forth. But I am um, friends on Facebook with um, many of our legislators. And it's great to get to know them that way too. So you kind of know where their interests lie. And in, in sometimes in, when you're you know, formatting your own personal story, that helps um, to know them a little bit more. And, yeah, I, I, oh, so much, I, I so much agree. Um, you know, Senator Weiler is, is he's not my senator, but uh, I do follow Todd Weiler on, on Twitter and, and he tweets constantly. Mm -hmm. um, he's, he's always on there. There's, there's several tweets by him each day. Um, Governor Cox um, is, is also a big Twitter user. Um, tweets about everything from what's going on in, in, in government uh, to the, vi uh, the vaccine, the COVID-19, to the jazz score. So he's, he's always tweeting and, and you can follow that and, and, and kind of get to know what, what they're thinking. And, 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 and you, sometimes, you know, you can engage them in, in a conversation on Twitter. Um, and, you know, it may not last long, but it's definitely something and they'll remember that, so. Yeah, I've just started tweeting <laughs> and uh, I, I found an old tweet that um, account that I had through a United Way meeting. They, they just all sign up for Twitter and suddenly came up and I was amazed at the number of legislators that tweet on there. And it really is a great way, almost better than Facebook. So this is so much garbage that comes on Facebook that this is just straight tweets. It's, it's really a good way. The other way uh, as well of really forming that relationship is during election time when people are running for election, if you support them and help them with, the, like Everett said, the signs in the yard, go out with the flyers and everything. I built up a relationship with my le legislator and she actually got in and now she's, she's an advocate for people with disabilities now. It's, it's really, it's worth building those relationships early if you can. So another quote that you probably have all seen and heard, but it seriously is um, so true still to this day. And it's never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. So when you're sharing your personal story, there's a couple of things um, that are helpful because we know our lives and our stories and everything about it are very complex because, um, you know, we all can, um, you know, understand what each other is going through, but, you know, the background and the histories and all of that are very different and unique to each one of you. And so we want you to tell those stories, but with that, we know that they do have limited time. They have a lot of information they have to absorb throughout the year, not just during the legislative session, 
But if you can get to a simplified version of your life story to use for your advocacy efforts, uh, the shorter, the more simple, the better. And you want to illustrate your key messages, you know, provide those examples of how they play out in real life, which means your life, and then just demonstrate how you have been directly impacted. There's so many things that, you know, we know that pass and some things really affect us in a positive way. And then others, you know, it really have a negative effect on the day in the life of our families. And it can be chronological in the order of your life, events that have happened or be broken down into themes or issues, depending on, you know, what you are educating them about. And your key messages are the thread running through your personal story. They should be repeated often and as many, to, as many people as possible to understand what the true needs of your family, your community is. I also, um, and I think we've sent these slides, so hopefully they'll you know, be available. I know that you'll put them up because of the recording, but we wanted to include um, the, you know, contact information for our congressional um, representatives because sometimes even state um, legislation is impacted by what's happening at our federal level. And again, I think sometimes just letting our senators and representatives know about our families and how things are going only helps them as well understand the issues that are so important to us and our loved ones. So for us, you know, as our as being experts with our lived experience and knowledge, we have a responsible responsibility to engage in policy and systems change. I will give one example and then I'll let um, Everett and Janet um, talk. So we know that every year um, the waiting list for services through DSPD, it's a long waiting list. We know that some families or individuals have been on there for decades. Um, one thing that um, I can say that being involved as long as I have, I um, the picture of me there is with Julie Beckett. And if you don't know who Julie Beckett is, I would um, I would highly encourage you to uh, Google her as well. Um, she is the mother of Katie Beckett, which is truly why we have home and community-based services waivers, which includes in our state the DSPD waivers, as well as the technology dependent waiver and the um, um, medically complex children's waiver. With the work that I've done with Julie for years, um, that it, with family advocates telling their stories and being up at the Capitol and, you know, really letting those legislators know about the needs of those with medically complex children. And then with the data that I had collected and the experiences and having Julie as my mentor for all those years, we were able to get that medically complex children's waiver passed in a year that nothing was passing. So again, I think that gives kind of that testimony to say real lives of families and the ongoing you know, education of your lives. And, and for me, it was bringing in the data and the long history of Katie Becca and the waivers and why they're there really helped us that year. We were all surprised it changed that year. So I can be one that um, can say I have seen it and been involved and even as intimidated, I will say as I still am after all these years, you kind of get hooked on it because you know that they need to know your story. And, um, you know, I will be thankful forever for families that came before me and did this because my children needed the technology dependent waiver. And, and then families after mine um, needed the medically complex children's waiver. So that's just a small snippet of what I've been involved with and seen firsthand of how it can make a positive change for many families. 
Everett or Janet, do you want to follow up? Sure. Um, so one of the one of the things that that I I worked on um, with um, with the help of uh, LCPD and and the National Federation of the Blind of Utah about five years ago was um, a, a parents of it, it, it. A lot of states were facing issues where. Um, newly parent new parents were were having their their children um taken away from them when they were born um at uh, by child protective services or or some other other entity and uh like the, a hospital uh, person who didn't understand how two individuals with disabilities could could raise children uh and so it was a problem in 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 many other states it was not a problem in utah but what Utah was having an issue was um, when you have a, a parent or two parents and one parent um, does not have a disability uh, and one parent does and for whatever reason, you know, their, their marriage ends and, and they're, they're seeking a separation or divorce, um, the attorneys representing the, the non-disabled uh, parent will bring in the disability into the um, court proceedings and they'll they'll raise that um, you know like for instance a, a blind parent how are they going to get the child to um, school or how are they going to get the child to a doctor's appointment or, or something like that and and this this was this was affecting the the way the cases were decided uh, and 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 the way custody was decided uh, amongst these parents, and so we we brought this to uh, Representative Patrice Arendt's um, attention. We we utilized her because uh, she has a son who practices family law, uh, in, in, and it was families uh, is was something Representative Arendt um, really focused on, and and so this this was a big bill that that. Um, really made a difference and impact on her. And so she worked hard to get this bill passed. Um, we testified in, in front of the um, Senate committee and it was interesting, um, Senator Hilliard was there and Senator Hilliard said, this bill, uh, he, said, he said, you know, he didn't realize this existed and he did not realize that, that uh, you know, the disability was being brought into um, custody battles, uh, and he said this this was the most appalling piece of legislation uh, way back then when it was passed uh, back in the in the seventies. And he remembered it, and so he was really glad to see uh, us bring this uh, to a, a new bill and and get get the law changed. And so that was something you know we were really proud of. We were able to pass that in twenty sixteen and. A big difference, and, and, is, and will continue to make a big difference for uh, parents that that are having to go through it. So I, I would just briefly like to mention the picture of me in that photograph. That's a very special occasion. That was me getting my citizenship. I don't know why I waited forty years to get it. I've always been an advocate. Uh, so that is the most important thing uh, to vote. So use your power at the polls to vote for the person that you feel it will be the best to support you and your family in, in your needs. One of the instances I'd like to, to give is about five years ago, um, the way state agency run programs get funded is that the state agency will put in a building block and then that will go to the governor and then the governor hopefully will put that in his budget. So about five years ago, there was a lot of need in health and early intervention services, the Baby Watch Early Intervention Program was not included in a building block. So advocates, program managers, program directors, families, all worked hard and they found a champion in uh, Liz Escamilla and we got um, ongoing funding for Baby Watch in that year when it wasn't in the governor's budget. So even if something isn't in the governor's budget, even if you think you haven't got a chance, a strong group of advocates and voices 
parent stories. We could go up to the legislature. Children came with their parents and, and the legislators heard about the need for more, uh, for more funding for the growth in services. So that was an awesome experience. I don't think I'll ever forget. That was a great year. Um, this is a picture of when we got the medically complex children's waiver passed. Um, here is our contact information. And we, I know that we are running out of time, but wanted to open it up for any questions. And again, just kind of acknowledge that um, you didn't think that your voice counted or is heard. We wanted to kind of reverse that and say it is so vitally important. And as a coalition for all disabilities, all ages, you know, all agencies, we're, you know, a volunteer organization as well, but are more than happy to help in any way we can to help either contact um, your representatives or help you develop your personal story that's short. Um, whatever support we can give that you can really, you know, make a difference for your family and which means making a difference for the community and for the state. So with that, I'll ask if there's any questions. Folks, feel free to either use the chat feature or if you would prefer, you can unmute your microphone and just speak. I'll give you one more, um, just kind of little example of as you know, even though we all have our unique situations and yet we are all a part of a community of having these wonderful children, individuals in our lives. There's sometimes there is, um, you know, differences of opinions, which is great. Um, but I learned from um, Jan Foray, uh, Joey Stolkort and Chris Fossen who have been leading the coalition for years. I interviewed them for a federal campaign years ago and um, we, we talked to them as well as some of the legislators and said, you know, the one thing that's great about the coalition and the, the reason they have the, rep um, what was I gonna say, the um, reputation that they had was because they, they brought groups together. And, um, you know, even if there was a difference of opinion, they found a common ground to go forward with, to advocate for it. Then that way, you know, legislators said it was too hard when you had one group of a disability organization saying one thing and then, you know, another maybe disability specific organization saying another. And it was really hard for them to make the choices because they wanted to make the choices that were best for families in general across the state and, you know, their children or adults. And so I also encourage, you know, again, for the coalition, that is what we strive to do um, is try to find that common ground and, um, you know, really put forth an effort of all families, you know, and individual voices, as well as a coalition. So I put my email in the chat. So if you're interested in joining the coalition, just drop me an email and I will send you the link to the LCPD page um, where you can sign up, but we're not so advanced in technology that it links up with me. And I'm the one that has the email list to send out emails. So if you connect with me, I'll send you to the page, you can formally join. Uh, on the page, but it means I've got you and you'll get all the email messages. Um, there's no charge. Um, it's totally free. We're all a volunteer organization and uh, we'd love to have you all and your voices. So in the chat, um, I see that um, there's a comment. I was contacted by a rep 
Representative Ray Ward to speak about the DSPD wait list. I've started a Facebook group to find families to come with me. This is entirely new. And if someone would like to help us or give us advice. Actually, I've seen some of your posts through um, the Big Macs, um, I think, group and such. And that is wonderful. It is so awesome that um, Representative Ray Ward is reaching out to families. And yes, um, we would definitely be happy to uh, give any helpful information, resources, and such. And then um, there is also considering the long wait list for DSPD services. What do you suggest besides contacting our reps? Can we do to change that? So yes, the one of the biggest things again is um, we were absolutely surprised that um, one of the legislators didn't even know about the waiting list. So again, even if your representative, um, you know, whether they are on the House or the Senate, if um, even if they're not on that committee, please, please reach out to them because the more voices in the legislature that know about this, the better. And there is some, we don't know what will happen, but there is some legislation nationally that is looking to try to end wait lists for um, home and community-based services waivers, which is great. There's, you know, of course, some work to do on those, but um, even federally, they're starting to see that Families can't wait three decades to get any services. You know, individuals need these supports and services. Families need these supports and services. So, um, uh, oh, good. Um, if you haven't been on our Facebook page, Sylvia, um, we have put out some information and I don't know, we could probably send it out again about how to have your voice heard about that 1.6 billion and how Utah should, you know, to give your voice and how you should, um, oh, you did share it. Yeah. Um, again, that is something that if, if you find your representatives, let them know kind of what your, you know, your thought process is on what would help you know, your family, your community. Again, it's a lot of education and talking and I need to quit talking and let Janet talk. <laughs> no, no, just remember it's one time money. So it, it, it's one time. So it, it couldn't you know, be used, it could be used. One of the things we were thinking about and I can't remember now who I was talking to about this, I'm sorry, but there was a bill that passed for um, spouses who um, provide the care for their Caregiving. spouses to yeah. be. Um, and so, and that was uh, Representative Elison. And we talked about contacting him again to see if maybe we could have one time money for family reimbursement for care. So that's just one idea. It would just be a one time money for that one year, but that could make a difference. So just think about for you and your family, if there was one-time funding, what, what would make a difference? But, uh, and let your legislator know. Everett, do you have anything on that? No, I, I think you guys have all said it very well. well we just wanna say thank you for inviting us and, um, Hopefully we were able to give you some new information or at least um, give you the, the cheerleading squad to go out and talk about your needs, educate those that make those um, decisions about your family and your community. And with that said, I'll be done and let Everett, um, you can close us out. Well, again, um, I apologize for being late today. Uh, I had a work commitment that, that I was trying to get out of as fast as I could and get over here. And I, I so much appreciate the opportunity to present to all of you. Very much hope that you will, will join the LCPD if you haven't already. Uh, we meet uh, usually every third, uh, the first Thursday of every month. Um, and we are meeting right now um, over Zoom um, about 12.30 till about 2 p.m. Uh, on first Thursday of every month. So I believe, are we having uh, our next scheduled meeting next Thursday on the 6th, correct, Janet? 
Oh yeah. 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 <laughs> I've got I've got to send out an agenda. <laughs> I was yeah, thinking so. it was last week. Yeah, but it's this week and it's next week. Yeah. So yeah. I need to send out. I'll be sending out an agenda. So um, I've written Gina. Send me agenda items, please. Sure. <laughs> we, um, we 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 will probably take a, a month or two off during the summer but we'll pick back up again um, in the fall, uh, usually in, in September. Uh, so you'll, you'll see maybe even August. So you'll, but you'll, uh, we'll probably take a couple of months off in the summer, but we'll definitely pick back up. And then during the legislative session, we meet every week on the Monday um, at the same time, 1230 to two. Uh, usually um, if we can meet at the Capitol, uh, we have a room reserved at the Capitol and we, we will meet there. Uh, in the, I think it's on the Senate side, but uh, but we we meet there and uh, and so you can meet in person and that's a great you know coming on those Mondays and then kind of watching what some of the stuff that goes on if you have the time uh, that's a great time to come and participate. Uh, if we're not able to do it in person next next year, we'll we'll definitely continue the meetings over Zoom. Great. Thank you all so much. Um, that was a lot of information, a lot of really helpful information. And I appreciate you guys breaking it down um, for some of these really intimidating topics and explaining everything and um, breaking it down for us. So um, as Gina mentioned, uh, or I think Janet, you mentioned, um, I joined the coalition and Carrie joined LCPD. So we um, went to our first meeting last month and got some really great information. We learned about a new department that was getting formed and we are just eager to learn more and get more involved and also help support our family. So we encourage you guys to reach out and join as well and attend the meetings and find out more about how you can get involved and educate your representatives so we can advocate for our community and make change. Um, I would love to get those slides. If you guys could send those out to me, I will send those out with the recording. And I just really want to thank all three of you for being here and thank all of our parents for joining and for all of the great work that you guys are doing. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank thank you. you. Have a great evening, everyone. Thanks.